Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. So in a previous lecture, I talked about radiometric dating, and I gave you a demonstration with pennies as to how you can use radioactive decay to date rocks. And this was first realized by Arthur Holmes early in the 20th century. He was picking up work started by Henri Becquerel, who discovered natural radioactivity. And Arthur Holmes figured out that you could use this natural process to determine how long a rock has existed. If, for example, you take a rock that has minerals that contain radioactive elements, he reasoned, why couldn't you look at that and say, based upon how long it's existed, those radioactive elements will decay to their daughter products? You know, if you can measure both, then you can determine the age of the rock. In fact, Arthur Holmes pioneered the study of radiochronology as a scientific discipline. The systematic examination of rocks and the use of radioactivity and the results of it to determine the age of the rocks. And the way Holmes did this, since then a lot more work has been done and a lot of techniques are now available using different radioactive isotopes, a whole wide range of them in fact. But what Holmes started doing is looking at uranium-238. Uranium-238 is the isotope of uranium that makes up most natural uranium. You can also have uranium-235 um, and so forth, but the primary isotope in a slug of uranium from the Earth's crust is uranium-238. Uranium doesn't just decay to one thing. It decays to one thing that decays to something else that decays to something else through a long chain of decays finally ending at lead. So what's happening is that the uranium in a crystal lattice, in a mineral, in a rock, the individual atom of uranium sitting in that mineral lattice will at some point decay. It's got a long half-life, about four and a half billion years. But eventually, randomly, individual atom of uranium will decay to thorium-234. That doesn't last long. It's got a less than a month half-life. Then it decays to protactinium-234 for about a minute. That decays really quickly to uranium-234. That's going to stick around for a while, a couple hundred thousand years before it decays to thorium-230. Then that is around for a few centuries before it decays to radium-226. It lasts about 1,600 years, and then that decays to radon-222. Radon only has about a four-day half-life, and then it decays to polonium-218, then lead-214, bismuth-214, polonium-214, lead-210, bismuth-210, polonium-210, and then finally lead-206. Lead-206 is a stable radiogenic daughter product from uranium-238 decay. And if you have minerals that contain uranium when they form, over time, their complement of uranium will decay, turning eventually into lead. So what we can do is we can look at the ratio of uranium to lead in a rock and determine from that information how many half-lives have passed since that rock was produced through natural processes. And in fact, we use a few minerals to do this because of, there are a few particular minerals that work really well for it, primarily zircon. Zirconium silicate, zircon. It's a common mineral in some forms. The crystals can grow large enough to become gem quality. And you've seen them in either displays probably or in jewelry stores. You can buy things with, with zircon jewels. But we're talking about smaller pieces than that, that are in rock, that are in something like this granite to the right, where zircon is a secondary mineral, a minor mineral that's present, but you can pull them out of the rock. Why? Because they contain uranium when they form. Zirconium silicate can allow uranium to substitute into it. And so there can be a small distributed concentration of uranium present in any zircon grains that are present in other forms of rock. That's nice because these zircons also don't pick up much lead when they form, mainly uranium. And so the uranium over time will decay to lead, specifically uranium-238 decays to lead-206. There can be a small amount of lead in the zircon when it forms, but fortunately that's going to be primarily of non-radiogenic forms like lead-204. The science behind this can get pretty complicated. But essentially what we can do is measure very carefully the concentrations of uranium and lead and their isotopes in a chunk of zircon, and we can determine how old that zircon is, and therefore the rock that it formed in is that old. We're using small pieces, not like this museum or collection quality specimen, but in fact, tiny sand-grained pieces. If you look at a granite, what a research team will do is take that, break it apart, grind the granite up into, into smaller pieces, and then dissolve it in acid. 
Zircon is useful for us because not only does it contain uranium when it forms, it's also very tough. It's not the hardest mineral on Earth. I'm not talking about hardness. The hardest mineral is diamond. Zircon is just tough. It resists weathering quite well. It'll stand up to punishment pretty well. And so pieces that are very old can be chemically intact in their interior. And you can break them up, dissolve those, and determine what the lead and uranium content is. Or use highly sophisticated techniques where, such as this image here, which shows individual zircon grains picked out of the residue from the acid dissolution of a rock. And literally, people who work on this dissolve rock, go through the residue, and by hand, with tweezers under a microscope, pick out individual zircon grains that came out of that rock. You can then put those zircons in, for example, an ion microprobe, a device that shoots a beam of ions at these individual small grains and extracts from them a tiny sample of what is evaporated from that, that rock. The uranium and the lead concentrations are analyzed in that stuff that you can zap out of those grains and you determine how old they are. It works really well. It's very meticulous, very difficult work to do, but the results are very precise. So here's how this can be applied to understanding the ages of rocks. Let's say we have these two zircon pieces and I'm going to simplify things by just saying, let's, let's throw in just a few atoms of uranium just for the purposes of visual clarity here. Let's say that these zircons began with a small amount of uranium in them. Now you notice as time progresses, I'm allowing time to progress at an accelerated rate in this video, but essentially what you're watching is that over time, every so often, one of those uraniums is going to quickly go through its decay series and wind up at lead 206. From our purposes, if we're assuming that very large stretches of time are passing, then the actual transition of going from parent 238 to daughter 206 is going to be near instantaneous. So over time, the rocks, as you'll see, are accumulating daughter product at the expense of parent isotope. And this is no different than what I introduced in a previous lecture where I used throwing pennies on a table as an example of extracting half each time, roughly, that lands head versus tails, and then doing that multiple times, representing multiple half-lives. The decline curve I got from those experiments that I already showed you is the same kind of decline curve you'd get looking at uranium in a rock. Looking at uranium-238 bound up in zircon grains, extracted carefully from a rock, and those grains analyzed individually and precisely you would see a decline of 238 and a rise of lead 206 as time goes on. And this would allow you, once you work through the technical details of actually physically doing the work, because it's pretty difficult work, once you go through that, you will be able to use the analyzed geochemical data from your samples of zircons to determine the age of the zircons. If the zircons are in primary rock where they form, like in a granite, then you determine the age of the granite. If the zircons are grains in a sediment, like there are zircon grains in a sandstone, then you've dated the zircon grain, and you've dated, you've dated the zircon grain, but you haven't dated the sediment just from that. The zircon grain can be much, much older than a sedimentary rock in which it is found. We can date a wide variety of earth materials, including, for example, this old zircon, a sample of which derived from rock in the Jack Hills of Australia. The rock itself is a sediment, originally, and the zircons came from somewhere else. The zircon itself can be dated, and its primary igneous rock that it came out of, that it formed in originally, was 4.4 billion years old. We can date things with uranium lead geochronology ranging all the way from that immense age down to just a few million years. It's a very precise, very reliable technique. Beyond that, you can use this technique to date meteorites. Meteorites that fall to Earth formed when the solar system formed. They've been flying around through space since then, and not much has happened to them until they land on Earth. You look at meteorites, and you get characteristic ages in the range of about 4.56 billion years. Meteorites that fall to Earth can be independently dated, independently measured, and they all return essentially the same date. Because they didn't all form at the same time, they formed over a period of a few million years when the solar system accreted, you don't get exactly the same number for every one of them, but they all fall within that range, about 4.5 to about 4.6 billion years ago. This also matches what we know of the moon. When the Apollo astronauts went up there, they brought back a lot of samples. 
of old lunar highlands crustal material as well as younger lunar mare crustal material. But the ages match up what we would expect. The moon formed about 4.5 billion years ago. Some of the stuff on the moon, some of the rocks are younger than that because there are lava flows that erupted later. But the oldest rocks match what we know as the oldest rocks in meteorites and the oldest rocks we have on Earth. And the nice thing is we don't have to rely just on uranium and lead for radiochronology. In fact, there's a large number of elements that decay into other elements and are useful in dating a wide range of rocks and minerals. Here are a few examples, and I'll start with uranium itself because we get to use another isotope of it for radiochronology, not just uranium-238. U-238 has a half-life of about 4.5 billion years, and it's useful in minerals that contain uranium as a minor ingredient. So things like zircon, the minerals monazite, xenotime, apatite, are pretty useful for uranium lead research, but not exclusive. Other minerals are useful as well, a wide range of minerals, but these are particularly good. You also get to use uranium-235. Most of uranium, over 99% of it, is U-238, but a small amount is uranium-235, and it has a much shorter half-life. It's actually a lot more radioactive. 235 is the isotope you'd use in a nuclear reactor. It's fissionable. It has a half-life of about 704 million years, and it's obviously useful in the same minerals because uranium behaves like uranium. But it's very nice because often in minerals we can use both techniques at the same time. So you get two independent age determinations from two completely different decay series. Another useful parent-daughter isotope series for radiometric dating is thorium. Thorium-232. Thorium occurs naturally in rocks at low concentrations, often the same rocks you'll find uranium in, but other minerals such as thorionite and some others. Thorium-232 decays to its own decay chain down to lead-208, a half-life of about 14 billion years. This one's actually useful if you pull zircons, for example, out of a rock. You can use uranium and potentially thorium dating techniques as well. With uranium, you get two isotopes. With thorium, you get another one. And you can have three completely independent chemical assessments of the age of the rock from three different decay series. That can be very useful. Another useful series is samarium neodymium. These are rare earth elements, and they're unfamiliar to a lot of people. But the rare earth elements are geochemically very useful and very interesting. They all have similar behavior to each other, but their behavior varies in a systematic way across from lanthanum on the left all the way to ytterbium on the right on this diagram. It also includes lutetium, element 71. The rare earth samarium decays by alpha emission to neodymium. Samarium-147 decays to neodymium-143. Half-life is about 106 billion years. Samarium decay to neodymium is not a decay chain. It's a single decay. Samarium-147 directly decays to neodymium-143. And the other radioisotope systems I'll be mentioning uh, in this lecture, other than uranium and thorium-based, the rest of them I'm going to be mentioning are single decay pairs. It's one parent going to one daughter. Rubidium-87 will decay to strontium-87 with a half-life of about 50 billion years. Because these elements are not that rare, they're present in a lot of rocks at low concentrations, they're actually really useful. So, also because rubidium and strontium have different chemical properties. So, most minerals that incorporate some small amount of rubidium will be potassium or sodium minerals that are substituting rubidium for it. And those kind of minerals would be very unlikely to substitute, say, a magnesium. So, therefore, strontium also doesn't sub usually much into such minerals. So it's very useful geochemically. Rubidium-strontium dating is useful for a wide range of rocks. Metamorphic igneous rocks, lunar samples, meteorites. It's a widely used and tried and true technique. Potassium-argon dating is also useful for a wide range of things. Potassium-40 will naturally decay to argon-40 with a half-life of about 1.3 billion years. This technique is useful for old and fairly young materials. Specifically, though, certain minerals are better for this than others. Mica, feldspars, hornblende, for example, are really nice minerals that this works for. It has to be more specific in this case because potassium-40 is decaying to a gas. Argon-40 is a gas. And so a lot of mineral lattices simply won't trap the argon very well. It'll drift away. Other minerals are able, in a lattice where the potassium resides, it is in a lattice cage, essentially, that prevents the argon from escaping once it transmutes into argon. Finally, at least for this lecture, radiocarbon dating, carbon-14. This is probably the most famous and widely known radiochronological age dating technique out there. Carbon-14 shows up in the movies, it shows up on TV all the time as a plot device. 
often you'll see movies where a geologist will casually say something about we've radiocarbon dated the rock and I always cringe because you can't do that you, you don't radiocarbon date rocks typically radiocarbon dating here's how it works inner atmosphere cosmic rays are constantly bombarding the upper atmosphere and striking whatever molecules are there including nitrogen when a cosmic ray strikes nitrogen it can transmute it basically into through a nuclear reaction into carbon-14 which is radioactive Nitrogen-14 converts into carbon-14, but it's unstable and eventually will decay back to nitrogen-14. And that's where it comes in useful as radiocarbon dating. When the carbon-14 forms, it will oxidize to CO2 usually in the atmosphere, where it's taken up by plants and incorporated into living biomass. So anything that eats the plant takes that carbon up as well. So basically everything that's alive at any one time is partially composed of carbon-14. Some of the carbon in their bodies is not just carbon-12 or carbon-13, which are stable and normal, but also a small amount of carbon-14, which is constantly decaying, but while you're alive, you're constantly taking in fresh carbon-14 in your food. When you die, you stop taking in fresh carbon, and so the clock simply continues to run out, but you're not adding more carbon to your body anymore. So. The longer the corpse sits there, or the longer the seashell sits there, or the piece of charcoal at an ancient campfire, as long as that exists, the carbon-14 is going to continuously decay away until finally there's nothing left. As long as there's some there, we can measure the age. Which means, in practice, carbon-14 dating can't be used for anything older than about 75,000 years. About 10, 12 half-lives. Past that, you got nothing left. Th there's nothing there to measure. Techniques could be improved to drive that date back a little bit. Maybe one day we can get back to 100 or 150,000 years uh, with better machinery. Uh, but past a certain point, you just can't go any further. So for rocks, for dinosaur bones, ancient sediments, for meteorites, things like that, no, you can't use radiocarbon for that at all. It is essentially not a geological technique except for certain specific research applications. It is primarily a technique for anthropology, for archaeology, uh, study of very recent sediments, things like that. Anything younger than about 75,000 years. So for most geological applications, it's just not part of the picture. We depend primarily in geology for dating deep time on radioisotope measurements involving things like uranium lead dating, potassium argon, samarium neodymium, rubidium strontium, things like that. Those are the tried and true workhorses for dating geologic materials that are very old.